Welcome to The Developmental, a podcast about the messy, beautiful ways grown-ups grow up. Here, we explore turning the science into the day-to-day practice of adult development in teams, homes, organizations, and life. Hello, friends, and welcome to the last episode of The Developmental for 2023. This has been a great year for learning around adult development, and I've had a blast interviewing an amazing array of thinkers, practitioners, and researchers in this space who have taught me so much and I hope have inspired your own thinking and practice in this field. This last episode features two incredible women and a topic that perhaps out of all of the ones we've approached this year is the one that I have most to learn about. Today's topic is about embodiment and vertical development. Embodiment in a very concrete sense of understanding our body, befriending it, and exploring the ways in which the body itself can be a vehicle to our lifelong growth. If you're like me, sometimes pushing your body to the brink of exhaustion in your rush to get to the next thing that is truly important to tick off your list, this is absolutely an episode to listen to. It's going to invite you to slow down, to reflect, and to connect to the most important part of you that's actually making all of the rest of you possible. So I'm hoping this is going to be as interesting an exploration for you as it has for me. My guests, Natalie Goni and Haley Linthwaite, are both practitioners in the vertical development space and both have a deep, deep passion and connection to the somatic practice and research. So they are both walking this almost unexplored line between embodiment and adult development practices. And they're here to share some of their wisdom and also share a couple of practices with you, which I hope will be a perfect way to end the year in a very present and self-connected way. A little bit about my guests, Natalie Goni. With over a decade of developing talent and leaders at one of the largest financial institutions, and as an executive coach and group facilitator for the past seven years, she has not only always worked in the field of growth and people development, but she's also an avid and continued explorer of her own development journey through the lenses of adult development, embodiment, and our emotions. Based in Hong Kong, Natalie is grateful to work with leaders and individuals across Asia Pacific and all over the world. She brings an interdisciplinary and very human approach to coaching leaders and teams, drawing upon leadership development, team dynamics, and self-exploration practices with systemic and post-conventional meaning-making approaches that increase self-awareness, build emotional maturity, and stretch one's capacity to think and feel in more complex and adaptive ways. Natalie supports her clients through key leadership transitions to build new skills and new ways of being. She is also a faculty member at Heart Hill. Haley Linthwaite has, for the past 30 years, made it her life's work to ignite the sparks of transformative change all over the world. An experienced facilitator, coach, consultant, social entrepreneur, and educator, she has empowered countless leaders and teams, facilitated multi million dollar organizational change programs, founded social enterprises, and cultivated a community of change makers. She bridges the latest explorations in systems change, adult development, and neuroscience with the transformative power of the arts and embodiment to unlock profound shifts in individuals and systems. All of her work is propelled by her unwavering belief in our human capacity to ignite change and create abundant futures. She holds a PhD in transformational change, applied performance, a Master of Creative Industries, drama teaching, a graduate Bachelor of Education, and a Bachelor of Arts in Drama. As you will see, these two wonderful women hold a wealth of wisdom. And this is a conversation that has deeply inspired me, and I hope it does the same for you. Here are Haley and Natalie. Wonderful women, Haley and Natalie. So good to see you both. 
and so good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Lovely to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to finally, finally have you both in the same space <laughs> because we've been nerding out separately, but this is actually the third time, the first time, the third time. See, that's wishful. That's my intention already there. <laughs> the first time where all three of us are in a Zoom room on two continents. Natalie, you're in Hong Kong and Haley and I are here. Haley's in Brisbane and I'm on the sunny coast. So welcome to the developmental. And uh, I was saying when we were setting intentions before we started the recording that my big intention today is to learn. I think I've got a lot to learn about this topic of embodiment and what it means and what its impact is on our lifelong growth. So I'm very excited to invite both of you to bring some of your wisdom in and Maybe start with, with the first question that always is always my first question. You know, how do you get to do the work you do? Because I, I always think we somehow do work that is embodying in some shape or form our essence. Hopefully we get to that place. So how did you get to do the work you do in this space of embodiment? <laughs> I love it. And you, I can see it st yeah, staring at each other going, who's going to speak first? Go, Haley. So thanks, Natalie. It's Haley here. Yes. And of course, Alice, I've been thinking about this because I could take back to the dance classes that I had as a young person. But if I synthesize a long ish relationship, apart from having nearly 50 years of being in a body, arts practices is what brought me into a more formal relationship with embodiment. So my background has been in dance or physical theatre, even sort of facing fears and relationship to heights and engaging with circus. And I think if I think about vertical development and embodiment and that idea of pushing through or meeting our limitations and extending those, certainly flying trapeze was that experience for me. So it was the first time when I realised, actually, I'm afraid of something, but if I keep turning up, I could learn or transcend or move through. So I did that for 18 months, but anyone who's listening to this who was part of that journey with me will be able to attest that I never stopped weeping for the 18 months. So the tears weren't necessarily emotional, but they would just literally be like a, a physiological response. But I did get to achieve tricks and, and skills that I didn't have at the beginning. So it was an interesting journey, sort of, I suppose, circumnavigating my emotional system in order to still progress physically. And that's again, 15 years ago, but my current relationship with embodiment has come out of a gift with COVID. So a very particular relationship with a company called the 360 Emergence. And so I've begun dancing online in the middle of the night and then now moving that more into a very formal relationship and taking on board their apprenticeship. And so the journey of embodiment now is more about how do we expand our capacity for that dilemma within in dance and movement and response to learning about ourselves each time we practice. Oh, beautiful. I've got like 10 questions coming up in my head. I'll just, I'll just uh, invite Natalie in to, to bring her own, you know, how, how did you get to this kind of work, Natalie? And then we can go down some rabbit holes. Mm. Well, mine is definitely not as fabulous as flying the trapeze, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I really do want to do that. Um, my, I've always had a, I've kind of had these parallel paths. One has been the corporate life and working in HR and people development, and and then in my private life, kind of exploring yoga and different healing modalities and so I had a very heady kind of day job but was always exploring something in my my personal life that was was quite embodied although I didn't really know that at the time and actually what really brought me to this path was was my body not doing what I wanted it to do and that was actually trying to get pregnant about mm, must be about Oh, goodness me, I don't know, 10 years ago now. And, and that was, that was kind of like a, a shock. It was like, oh, you know, it, it, suddenly my body wasn't doing what I thought it should do. And, and, and actually that process of 
trying to get pregnant and not getting pregnant and and really brought me really fully into my body actually it really brought me to explore kind of what was happening how I was treating my body how stress was impacting my body so that was really the kind of the the disorientating dilemma shall we say which really then opened up a journey of of exploration of the body yeah so and that's been my kind of path uh, in parallel again to kind of the heady stuff for the last sort of eight eight to ten years or so yeah that resonates so deeply Natalie and it makes me think of something that I growing up I thought it was a good thing and I kept saying it as a matter of pride that you know my body is this vehicle that carries my brain around Mm -hmm. Um, And now in hindsight, I'm thinking, oh, how dysfunctional that way of looking at myself used to be. But I'm hearing in what you're saying, almost this belief that we're taking our body for granted and it's kind of assumed it's there doing its job. And then when it doesn't, that kind of forces us into a different reckoning with it as way more than a vehicle to carry our brain around. Have I got that right? Yeah. And it, it it's almost like, I think sometimes what brings people to embodiment is this realization of disembodiment. Yeah. You know, and what I really realized was because I was in a very kind of intellectual environment and I was flying around the world and facilitating programs and working with really smart people and solving big challenges. And, and I was really pushing my body. I was ignoring, you know, things that it needed and and so there was there was that process of coming from oh there's a there's a disembodiment feeling here i'm seeing you nod there Haley. any thoughts oh yes no i'm I'm having the i've got at least 10 questions to respond to that and you know there's a there's a snap and a ditto in having experienced my own journey of infertility and my body not achieving what it's what I would like it to do. And then this, the journey that that led, even in an intercultural context and exploring different possibilities or different cultural responses to those kind of journeys. But where I really- Do you want to say more about that? that Well, yes. And I want to recognize and say, Natalie, thanks for bringing that storyline in. I mean, I'm just thinking about when- when we talk about embodiment and that idea of flying around the world and, and working with leaders in a, in a heady component capacity, one half of my PhD took me into Papua New Guinea. And so I was working with leaders there in a very different context. It was a sexual health education program. And so your relationship to your body is very different when you're having to collect water every day because there's no running water or electricity or it's, you know, that survival and thrival in, um, yeah, it, it brings you into a new relationship with your body. So also working with people who have a different relationship with their body is as uh, interesting in terms of a feedback loop from the outside in as it is from working in that inside out. And disembodied is nearly, it, it's a concept in some cultures and not in others. I suppose it's like all concepts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What does what does disembodied mean for each of you? Because uh, we... I, I've th- I've thrown the word in, and I know our topic is embodiment, but I, I'd love us to articulate a bit more concretely what that is and what it isn't. What does it feel like when it's not there? So maybe let's start in reverse. What is disembodiment for you? What does it feel like? So I notice you've got your hand on your your chest there, Alice. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's it, it is that that feeling of taking our body for granted and it being the vehicle that gets us to the next meeting or the the next holiday or whatever it might be and I think it's overriding the sensations that we have in the body so whether that be pain or tension or you know we tend to kind of override things by having a glass of wine to soothe anxiety or taking and 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 none of these things are bad things but i think when we we take soothers or numbers to numb sensation that's a, a, an experience of disembodiment we're not really listening and being with the sensation of 
what's happening in their body, whether it's pleasant and or it's unpleasant. And then there's a whole, you know, there's a whole kind of piece you can talk about around intuition and gut feeling and, mm-hmm. and all of that. But I think that's my initial experience of disembodiment. Mm. Yeah. I I love that idea of not listening to the the textures because we often talk about the difference between functional and embodied movement as moving, making the invisible visible. And that first step is being able to feel the invisible or allowing ourselves to feel the invisible. So that disembodied component, Alice, I was just thinking in my head, it does come back to, to I suppose, if I want to use the word cultural context. So if I think about it for a leader or clients that, that I work with in a corporate context, it might be those patterns that arise um, when we think we know that we need to behave differently or that we, there is a different, we understand what is needed, but when that we're confronted with that challenge or task, patterns arise. And so we just do what we've always done as opposed to being able to invite in an expansion of listening to the body in that moment, practicing what or, or executing what we've practiced, which is having different responses available to us and making those. So you mean like almost living on autopilot and getting into these behavioral patterns that we do without thinking and it's like we don't choose what to do. Our body kind of does its own thing. Or Yes, absolutely. It's a well-worn pathway and it's a great pathway. It may have got us to where we are, but perhaps now it's not the most effective choice in going forward. And then I think about disembodied in other contexts where we either disassociate or things happen to our bodies or we allow things to happen and we, we completely disconnected from either the feeling, the sensation or the knowledge or the awareness. And then I, and then I, and then, yeah, they're rolling. And I think who disembodied can actually also look like someone who's in excruciating pain and they have no idea why. And it's physically manifesting in, in a tummy ache or, or anxiety becomes nauseous or and, you know, something becomes painful and, and yet, so disembodied doesn't equal not feeling the body at all. Sometimes it can be an override of the body and we still don't understand what's going on. So there's a, dis- when we push, or when we push through the pain, through the physical pain and treat it like this almost mechanical symptom of something, we don't know what that is. And we don't want to investigate because we're just, you know, it's a problem to solve because you have stuff to do. So you don't slow down yeah. to kind of go, what's, what's happening here? Why am I in pain? What's my, is my body actually trying to <laughs> communicate mm. something here that I should be paying attention to? Is that, yeah. 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 Mm. And that's, I think, such an interesting one, because if I think of all the corporate contexts, all three of us spend so much time mm. in, I think they're full of people. And I include myself in this category quite often when, I just ignore my physical pain or my physical discomfort and kind of, you know, will it away and it doesn't go away usually, but not necessarily reflecting or considering pain, a sort of invitation to dialogue, Mm. pain problem to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be also numbness. So this is where it's that multifaceted, multi-laying. So it could be excruciating pain. It could be numbness, not feeling any pain at all. It could be nausea, but there is a disconnect of either the understanding or that, as you said, it's an invitation to inquire into what can I learn from this? Yeah. So then numbing becomes the strategy to keep on, maintain the pattern of disembodiment. Yeah. And that could be through our habits like drinking that extra glass of wine or it could be through overwork for some people where we keep ourselves so busy and just don't have time to think about what we actually feel Mm. food I was thinking back to my time when I was fully my full-time corporate role and and there were times when I would literally have pret manger for breakfast lunch and dinner because I was in the office for so long and some, sometimes I'd look back and think, oh my goodness, I've had all three meals today at, at Pret. I don't know. I think you have Pret in Australia, don't you? Most people know what Pret is. Yeah. And even if you 
if you take a second now and feel, can you feel the last meal that you had in your that you had in your stomach? Can you feel that? Can you connect with that sensation? And when you can connect with that sensation, some people can and some people might not be able to. It brings more of awareness of, oh well, what did I eat? Yeah. I love you say that. That is that that actually captures one of my biggest insights from and after meeting my husband, who's a chef 13 to almost 13 years ago. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've learned so much about my body through him and his relationship to food. But I remember, especially in the early years, I had such a functional, Haley uses this word around movement, but I had a functional relationship with food where mm. food gets fuel, like, you know, <laughs> the body needs to eat so it can keep on going. And, and he would always be in this space of let's savor food. What are we actually eating and how do these ingredients come together? And let's just slow down and let's cook food. And I felt like cooking is just this waste of, I could be doing something better with my time. Feels like blasphemy. But, but it's, it's just such a, the, the moment I, I was able to realize that I've eaten something really good for my body and felt that 10 hours later in my body, that was like this big breakthrough moment. So when, when you said it now, I thought, ah, oh, yes, this is actually maybe a step towards embodiment. Yes. And how that start having that awareness. Yes. So what else is embodiment? Like we, we've looked at disembodied and what that feels like. So we're starting to veer toward what, what does embodiment feel like? And, and what is the value of it really? Why, why would we do all this effort to step back or come back into our own bodies? Who wants to go first? And then, <laughs> we're both smiling at each other. I'll say one sentence and then, and then I mean, in, for me, it's the conscious and the subconscious. It's a way to really draw awareness. So even if I was to reduce embodiment to one word, I'd probably choose awareness, becoming aware. And with that, there's a lot of things that you're becoming aware of, but bridging the subconscious with the conscious I think is one of the greatest gifts and it's a practice. It doesn't just happen once. It's not something that you do and then you've gained. It's just everything we're constantly in life and with people and humans and ourselves. So it's an opportunity to be able to process and be aware of mm. how we're being impacted in, the, in those contexts. Sorry, Natalie, that was way longer than one sentence. Mm. So, can I ask a clarifying question on that? Yes. Are you saying that the body is, in your view, the bridge between our unconscious and conscious? So, so in order to be able to bring stuff into awareness, we actually need to be in touch with the body? Oh, and I love your clarifying. So I'm going to add something here. So I started, especially my apprenticeship with the 360 Emergence, wanting to explore the body. And actually, I have now zoomed out and I've removed the body majority of the time I'm talking about expanding one's capacity or one's understanding. So because the body is inextricably linked to our emotional and rational, our cognitive brain, our heart, obviously, our intuition or our spiritual side, it's a way that all four are able to integrate the subconscious with the conscious. It's just a vehicle in because we can't always think ourselves into that process because as we already started with earlier today that we can be over thinkers in our context in our worlds that we all inhabit so it's one way to be able to try to shift and over index in the cognitive or the rational by moving into the physical yeah i love that that is such a beautiful and intriguing idea that to actually truly become more self-aware you need mm. to befriend your body because mm. otherwise you'll cognitively understand stuff, but you won't actually embody it, be, translate that awareness into action. For that, you need to, to befriend the body. What's, mm. what's happening for you, Natalie, there? It's, it's making me, I love that, what you said, Haley, about this, the, the, it being the kind of bridge between the conscious and unconscious and the body is the body is fully in the present it's the mind that 
is able to move from the past to the future, but the body is fully in the present. And one of the most powerful experiences I had of being in the body, and Haley and I talked about this when we met last week, because we've both done this, is Vipassana, doing a Vipassana mm-hmm. meditation, which is 10 days of total silence, pretty much like 12 hours of meditation every day for 10 days. And the, the Vipassana meditation is being aware of what is, of the, the current reality of what is happening in your body, the sensations that you experience. So when you've been sitting there for 90 minutes, trying to be as still as you can, noticing, just scanning your body from, from top to toe of what sensations you're experiencing. And you might be having your foot numb and your, your hips are aching and your back sore, but you might feel a little bit of pleasure just in your, or kind of a, a buzzing sensation in your arms. And that experience of just feeling what's happening in the body at, at any given time was so powerful. So the, the, the body is what brings us to the present. And I, what, in answer to your question, Alice, why is it important in terms of our growth and, and obviously what, what we all focus on, which is vertical development, it, it, it's this piece around emotions, I think. And, you know, I was visiting, revisiting your visual, Alice, of, that came out of your research of the edge emotions. And, you know, the piece that, that could be slotted in there is, is how it feels in the body. So these emotions that we experience when we go through heat experiences or disorientating dilemmas in our lives, whether it be grief, loss, embarrassment, shame, the, the, the joy, how does it feel in the body? Mm-hmm. And to really be able to be with an emotion is to feel it in the body and, and not numb it, not try and push it away. And I think that's where the, the power comes in, in terms of embodiment and development. I think it's fascinating you saying that. And, and I was reflecting on, so because in the, from the research came this idea that you, you don't really change your mind unless you can withstand the painful emotions that come from having your mindset challenged, right? If we accept that vertical development is at the core, this capacity to look at the world in new ways, to really challenge our own thinking, that, that between that intellectual challenge and an actual shift in perspective lie these emotions. And the participants in the research seem to be able to bring curiosity to these emotions as a way to soothe the pain without numbing it. Mm -hmm. So then that made them capable to go, oh, how else could I look at this situation in a different way, despite the shame, despite the fear, despite the anxiety. But then when I tried to translate the research into some sort of practice to bring in organizations, what I found was that People can't really conceptualize these emotions. They can't even name them quite often. So right. they feel them in the body. So what came out of it was actually a somatic exercise where, you know, you sit with a dilemma and then you start to feel in your body the sensations and the emotions that come up when you hold that dilemma to leave my corporate job and start my own business or to stay in my corporate job, safety and adventure. And you feel the anxiety in your body. And then when you bring curiosity to the body, not, not to the abstract emotion, but to the body, something really fascinating happens and people go, oh, I'm just feeling my body relax. And that knot in my stomach seems to be easing up a little bit. And all of a sudden, all these new ideas about how else I could look at this dilemma that I'm struggling with pop up in my brain. And it's very hard to really understand cognitively how come bringing curiosity into your gut Mm. creates a cognitive shift but I think it's exactly what you were articulating just then this ability because the body is in the present so you can't really deal with your emotions unless you deal or you learn to feel them and experience them in your body yeah yeah and and it as you were speaking Alice it 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 reminds me that one of the key things for this is about slowing down 
is mm-hmm. about really because we live in such a fast world our mind is is brilliant our minds are brilliant brilliant at problem solving brilliant at imagining futures and but actually to really to be with the body and notice what's happening in order for us to have much better informed decisions you have to really slow down so it's a practice and it's exactly what I was just thinking Natalie and then it's the practice of being able to move with those emotions not within the moment so that practice whether it be a dance class or somatic coaching but experiencing moving oscillating between perhaps even the two polarities and what new information or what comes out of that so that then we are able to translate that off our dance floor, but it, it could be our, our yoga space and coach's room to translate that out of the physical practice and into our everyday so that we've got, we've had that capacity of understanding what the, the difference could be or what we understand about ourselves. Now let's actually apply it and show up in those contexts. And so there's so a what, resilience. It, are you saying, Haley, that in a sense, movement practices are a way to train ourselves to work with these sensations in the body and transmute them or transform Definitely. them? Definitely. Yeah, if we think about embodiment as such, as Natalie just brought up the word practice, we can't conceptualize this without understanding that it's a, the practice and what does that practice look like? And for some people, it might be working one-on-one with a somatic coach. Some people have come to this world from really strict martial art training. Others have come from a, a dance or, you know, sort of circus and embodied background. Others have... Uh, a variety, you know, there's yoga and breath, there's lots of different ways in which we learn the craft of working with the body, but the practice itself is then, or, or I am a firm believer that the power of the practice is bringing those inquiries in that you just referred to and understanding about the physical challenges and how they show up in our body and what does curiosity look like and what, how does, how do you move with that? enables us to then be able to have, we've practiced in a sense, we've learned it on the dance floor or we've experienced what we do or don't like, or we've learned something more about ourselves to then be able to walk out. And no, we're not going to walk in and do interpretive dance. That's often the joke in a corporate context, you know, <laughs> though perhaps sometimes interpretive dance could be far more clear than some of our deliveries. Having a conversation. But, yeah. Yeah. But it's just having that, the, the, the integrated, let's use the word integrated resource and capacity within to be able to trust ourselves in those contexts where we are either feeling vulnerable or triggered or their heat experiences or their catalysts for change. So how would you say, how would you both say, because that brings up a, a question for me that I believe a lot of people who listen to this podcast, who most of them are leaders in organizations or they're consultants like us doing varieties of, of developmental work. How do you bring this idea into organizations in a way that is not threatening, too fluffy, soft, not really, you know, that pragmatic kind of business question around, you know, so what's the value of this? We, we've touched on it, but how do we do, th- what, why, where does the resistance to this, where does it come from? Because I feel there's a lot of resistance. If you ask a group of senior leaders to get up and move, even if it's very, very mild, nothing spectacular, there's almost this awkwardness, weirdness around doing anything else than talking with our mouths and gesticulating with our hands and whatever we do when we're sitting around and having dialogue. But to have dialogue in a different way, you said interpretive dance, that would freak out 99% of the audience well, we, talk, we work with. Where, where does that come Alice, from? You? I think that's a whole, not just one podcast, but a series. Okay. I'm going to sum it up in one word, which is shame. We become ashamed of our bodies. We bring other conditioned and we've, we've held on to shame of either the way that we move or what move could be interpreted. Or I was just reading some of my research. I, I ran a leadership laboratory earlier this year and had reflective practice within themselves, reading some of the reflections from the participants. And I asked one of the questions around about how does this contribute to safety or not? And there was a moment when everyone in the room was whooping and clapping and they said that they're actually 
initially felt uncomfortable. However, because everybody was involved, they, that dissipated for them and they relaxed into it, but they wrote a caveat. However, if there was even one person who looked like they were judging or not contributing, then I would not have felt comfortable. So there's a real fear about how, of, of how we show up and how we're judged by others. And I think that's connected. It's uncertainty. It's, yeah, we, we're not quite sure what it's going to reveal about us. And perhaps it hasn't been valued in education. That's another whole podcast. Natalie. Mm, yeah, I would agree. I think that in society, the body is is seen as something that's wild and perhaps even primal and shameful in some ways. And and if you think about the kind of traditional work environment, it's very contained. We wear suits, we wear ties, we wear dark colors. You know, it's it really has been a disconnection of of the body. Let's totally take the body out of this environment, really. But it's always been there uh, in, in underneath in the way people dress and how they use their body in interactions or presentations, but it is very contained. So I would agree with Hayley. It's this sense of shame and what we attach to the body around its wildness and its unpredictability. So I think there's a little bit of fear there about what might happen if we bring the body in and, and how appropriate is that. And, and a, a, the other word that comes up for me is boundaries. I think most of us have not really been taught or understood how we have boundaries around our body and communicate those and what's acceptable for us and what isn't around closeness, space, touch, all of those things. So I think it brings up a lot of that of perhaps I won't be able to hold my boundaries or will someone else be able to hold their boundaries? Mm -hmm. And so in answer to your question, Alice, I think that bringing it into the workplace does require containment and real skill around mm -hmm. how you guide people through becoming aware of their body or feeling their body or exploring something through their body. It does require containment and safety. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and subtlety as well. Sorry, the, the word titration comes in. They talk about titration in, in the somatic and trauma mm -hmm. fields, you know, ju just little bit, little kind of bits at a time rather than full on, you know, let's mm -hmm. invite a group of leaders to explore anger through their body like you just wouldn't do that because it's just it's you know it's it's too much too quickly yeah, too much too quickly mm. and now all I'm going to add on top of all of that too is part of the why is to also have fun you know we talk so much about threat and reward and it's you know one of the the most joyful experiences we can have is, in, is actually letting go of our fears and our brains and, and connecting to that playful sense. And there's multiple ways that you can do that in organizations that isn't as, what's the word, when I want to do this with my hands, it isn't as alienating as we're going to do interpretive dance, but it's just, it's, you use music and response and yes, breath and play in order to be able to relax. So, yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because and uh, having known you for a good few years, I think you really walk the talk of joyfulness and playfulness. You embody that in the very way you are. And I, as a, as a mini case study, I'm probably at the opposite spectrum of that. I'm way more comfortable in the deep, slow spaces. So for me, when, when you invite me into movement as part of a learning experience, mm -hmm. that, that is actually deeply, deeply uncomfortable before it becomes anywhere near joyful or fun. Having a my eight-year-old in my life has taught me a lot about what the fun in that is. You know, that the kids are yeah. so great and they just want to be tickled and chased. And, and there's a lot of body play happening that is joyful that's where joy comes from but I'm finding and I'm assuming that I'm not alone in this that for me as a grown-up no. something that I've long forgotten I'm pretty sure I knew it as a kid 
but I'm having to relearn it. It doesn't come natural to me to feel the joy or to feel the fun and the playfulness in, you know, dance or movement or anything that is not having a deep, beautiful, profound conversation. Mm, yeah. And that's part of understanding our conditioning and those patterns that arise and knowing that I need to have all fun or I need to do my body, but then actually doing it is two very different things. Two very different being things. Able, yeah, you just can't suddenly go, oh, I'm going to dance today. Well, actually, in fact, you could not encourage you to try it anytime, anywhere. But, but yes, it, it's a gentle journey into a, well, if we use the word dance to dance experience, often it might just be simply movement. Mm. So there's a, a variety of different ways it could look like in different contexts from large rooms to, you know, you invite into movement, but there's music and there's perhaps a, a physical challenge. I know that there was one room of um, law firm leaders from a, around Australia that I ended up in an activity when they were increasing their heart rate, but we ended up having movement with music in a capacity that people did not, if they'd arrived that morning and you said, this is what you'll be doing today, they probably would have denied that they'd ever conceived possible. Let alone afterwards, it's one of those things that's, because it's also novel, quite memorable. Yep. And so, and I think mm -hmm. that's the other important part, and I'm not at all medically um, minded in that biological, physiological component, but breath, dance, it's like flushes the system. It's a cascade of Absolutely. emotions. There's connections there that are also happening that are beneficial beyond the joyful place or journey. Yeah, and, and there is the, what we know about how we hold things in the body in terms of trauma, past experiences, movement and things like shaking and dance and mm -hmm different practice we can do it, the research the research shows that it does help move things through us we let go of we let go of not necessarily the memories but the our thoughts about the memories with what our nervous system is holding about the memories and so there is like the work of Peter Levine Bessel van der Kolk all these really brilliant people who work in in the body and trauma it is a process of releasing that that yeah. needs to happen through movement so there's a healing there's a healing component to it and there's a growth component mm -hmm. to it yes yes and perhaps yeah. both of those at times go hand in hand yeah yeah because i think when we when we do process things and we do heal it creates space for growth it yeah. creates space for new mindsets, new beliefs, new ways of being. Yeah. Yeah. So in the context of organizations and, and mature leadership, which is what all three of us are really interested in, how do we cultivate wiser, more mature leaders? And, and in the vertical development or adult development research, there are certain ways in which we kind of recognize those mature leadership behaviors, things like meaningfully connecting with other people and being fully mm -hmm. present and, and being able to sense. I love this word. We used it a lot, like, you know, sensing into the system. What does that mean? And what do you actually use to sense into the system? Don't you actually use your body? So I'm thinking if we were to, you know, put ourselves in the shoes of a senior leader kind of exploring, you know, what might be the value of engaging into some of these practices. And I know that both of you have a, a bit of an experience for us as a practice. Mm -hmm. So we don't just talk about this stuff, but we also experience it a bit, a bit later on in this conversation. But what would, what would a leader become capable of doing if they had a better, more conscious, more harmonious relationship to their own body. What are the things that come to mind for you when you think of that? And I'll be happy to kick us off because I've, I've got a very recent example in mind. I've come from a workshop that I ran with an organization in the Middle East, a very, very interesting cultural context for me and speaking of the body and containment mm -hmm. or a lot of boundaries around mm -hmm. that in that context. And this was a, an almost a year long program. And there was a graduation ceremony where leaders uh, presented an experiment they ran through the program where they applied some of the program concepts to a challenge or an opportunity that they identified in their own leadership. And this one leader, 
he set out to better understand his own relationship to himself and the impact he was having on other people. So he ran this experiment for eight weeks. He had one question that he contemplated every week and he journaled on it. Things like, when did I feel at my wisest this week and what did that actually feel like and what did I do? Or when, what kind of impact did I have on other people this week? And as a, res as a result of this journaling, he actually got in touch with his body and a lot of emotions. So he ended up putting all of these emotions that he found in two big buckets. And he said, it actually blew my mind a little bit to, to find there was so much emotion and sensation in my body, which I got to without actually inquiring about the body. Mm. Uh, things like, you know, exhaustion and how my own exhaustion is then impacting how short I am and impatient with the people around me and how that actually creates conflict or amplifies conflict. When, and when I'm not exhausted, when I'm in a good place physically, I have a completely different type of approach and I'm more patient and then people respond differently. So this whole connecting how you feel in the body with how you behave and then the impact that you're having, that was a whole discovery journey for him. So I was thinking perhaps for him, one of the benefits was that he became way more aware of the signals in his body that were telling him today is not a good day for you to run this or have this very difficult conversation. Maybe mm. do it tomorrow. Maybe go to bed earlier. They were also wearing a biometric mm. device telling them how much they were sleeping. And as a group, they were sleeping very, very little or less than six hours per night, which again was a big insight for him, but for others in the group as well as to how our exhausted body is actually not responding in the best way. So I, I was thinking perhaps that is one benefit, but maybe there are others. What else? What else do you gain? What else do you become capable of doing? as a leader, from investing time and energy to befriend your body? One of my favorite, and I introduced the word Natalie, titration. So one of my favorite things to talk about when we try to understand what does expanded capacity look and feel like is this idea of self-regulation. So as you just described, you're aware of those triggers. So you're regulating yourself in that moment. And you talked about the impact and awareness of that leader for themselves. So to add to that, it's then of others around them. So understanding how they impact the non-verbals in their communication or how they're creating a space and holding themselves. I mean, plus it's uh, productive disequilibrium. You know, how are they holding a space for their team to sit in productive disequilibrium whilst they are also in productive disequilibrium. And that's not just a conceptual thought, that's emotional and physical. And so it's, it's that capacity, I would say, is one of the many, there's multiple benefits, but let's go with that one from self to, to themselves with others. Yeah, I, I would agree. It really is about that relationship to self and when someone has when we have a closer connected relationship to self we're able to understand our impact with others so I, I think there's a, a couple of things one is sustainability like our ability to mm. perform in a way or show up in a way that is sustainable I've worked with people in the past that that they've moved They've, they've been promoted into a bigger role because they've been mm -hmm. high achievers, they've been subject matter experts, and they fall into the trap of working harder and longer in order to operate at this more senior level because they're trying to just do more in terms of their expertise and their what they've previously been rewarded for. And it's not sustainable because... They are moving out, like you say, Haley, out of this, what we would call the window of tolerance, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and you, it's getting smaller. It get, exactly. Yeah. And the window of tolerance is, is our state of kind of homeostasis. It's when our body is feeling calm and grounded and we're able to self-regulate. And when we move out of that, that's when we often move out into fight, flight, freeze or fawn. 
And there's a wonderful therapist and illustrator actually called Lindsay Brahman, who creates these beautiful illustrations of what happens from a sensation perspective when we move out of the window of tolerance and into these these different states. So I think it's yeah, it's it's that it's the sustainability of being able to show up in a way that you that is healthy and that you are proud of and makes an Im- a positive impact on other people. Yeah, I love that. And I also love the growing list of resources for the show <laughs> Did you <laughs> that you're throwing in. So self-regulation, self-awareness, mm-hmm. broadening our window of tolerance or, or learning how to stay within our window of tolerance. Or get back there, get return, back return there. to it. What popped to mind as you were both speaking was also perhaps decision-making. And, and I've heard leaders mm-hmm. who talk about how you marry intuition with reason and analysis in a business mm-hmm. context, and particularly in context of ambiguity where you have insufficient information to make a rational, purely rational decision, that's where the gut starts to kick in as a, as a factor in decision making. And then if you're not in tune with your body, it's hard to pick up those signals. Yes. So perhaps we might be, yeah, we might be making decisions based on our feeling of being, wanting to be right to our ego or being rewarded for our expertise. And when someone is able to notice, oh, that's my decision is, is, is being driven by that rather than being able to slow down and think and connect to gut and reason yeah. is a very different um, way of making decisions. Yeah. And I, it also, this also makes me think of uh, something that in vertical development, we talk a lot about the idea of intention. What is your intention in mm-hmm. being here today, doing whatever you're doing, saying whatever you're saying? And this realization that quite often our intentions shift when we are interaction, we are in the middle of an interaction with other people. So we might come to mm-hmm. a conversation with an intention to help and support and solve a business problem. But then within that meeting, we get triggered and we're not aware that we're being emotionally triggered and our intentions mm. shift to being right, as you just said, or proving the other person wrong or having the last word. And then the whole dynamic of the conversation changes and we're no longer solving the problem together. We're actually in a power struggle and we haven't even realized we are in a power struggle. So I was thinking of how knowing your body better can actually become a red flag for those kinds of moments what does the need to be right feel like in your body so you can recognize Mm -hmm. it when it kicks in for me it's like this knot coming up in my throat and I just need to say whatever I think is right in the moment Um, and what I notice Alice is that when you say that it's like your body's moving forward like your whole you know when we want to be right when we want to show that we know or we kind of our body even moves forward Mm -hmm. and then we create less space for the person in front of us and just being aware and this applies to coaches as well so when when we're able to notice that and return to our midline we can then leave space again for for those that we're in dialogue with and also space for ourselves to oh what am I what am I actually wanting to achieve here? Where is this need to be right coming from or win or whatever it might be? So even just that subtle body movement has a really big impact. Mm. What I love about that is it links back to how we're meaning making humans or creatures. And again, if we think about how do we hold paradox or polarity in our heads and yes, there's cognitive tools but the dance floor is one of those wonderful places where I get to explore and I've seen others explore what is it like to be both playful and adventurous you brought in before Alice or have that I don't want to be here but actually I'm here and moving or it is disorientating sometimes to simply move to music you don't know because often we'll end up on a dance floor or at a wedding or somewhere because we know that song and we're connected to that or we'll go to that band. And so we have a relationship to the music which moves us, but suddenly we find ourselves moving. And so, again, 
where else? I mean, there are other places. I'm not going to say where else can we experience this, but it is such a, there's a potency, I think is what I wanted to drop in here. There's a potency to practice this about ourselves in a movement capacity in a variety of different ways, that then again is transferable to, in whatever context, because I'm not going to say that it's a non-dense context because we're moving our entire life, we're breathing, even when we're sleeping, we're moving. So, you know, movement here is the the key. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, I was just going to say, when, when, when you approached me, Alice, about doing this podcast, I said, this this kind of marriage of vertical development and embodiment was still very much an exploration for me and I'm learning as we're speaking and Haley, I love what you said then about this ability to hold paradox and multiple perspectives mm. and as we move to later stages of, of development actually embodiment and the practice of embodiment really does facilitate the ability to hold paradox and multiple mm -hmm. perspectives because it does create tension in the body and we know that we can feel grief and we can feel ho hopeful at the same time we can feel joy and we can feel um embarrassment or you, you, we can hold these multiple sensations and emotions so i think yeah it's making me realize that actually it's a huge part of later stage development this awareness of the body and with that i think comes this paradigm shifting thought that unpleasant sensations and emotions are not bad yeah mm -hmm. they just are just like the pleasant sensations and emotions and this idea that if we feel something unpleasant in our bodies, that's a sign of worry and we have to eliminate the discomfort as soon as it arises. Maybe we need to challenge that more mm -hmm. openly and systematically. Because if I think of back to, to the study, my study and the findings was there was always a negative emotion that was present when some sort of opportunity for vertical development arose. There was no ever just joy. And, and positive, mm -hmm. like even, even positive life events, like a great promotion that you've been working on for a very mm -hmm. long time, it comes with joy, but it comes with huge anxiety. Mm -hmm. I yeah. might be found out and your whole imposter syndrome kicks in and all of those things. So to be able to recognize the, the negativity or the unpleasantness in the body as an opportunity rather than a threat, mm -hmm. I think is a big part of, of what embodiment maybe is. And then the practices that you're touching on in working with those sensations and, and becoming more attuned to them so we're not taken by surprise and completely scared that we're feeling this thing and we don't know what this thing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just all, all the A words are dropping in now. So it's about acknowledging the body, accepting the body, attuning, as you just said, Alice, what's the other one? I just said, appreciating our bodies as opposed to having that comparative component or the relationship that could not always, the body's not serving us in a specific conditioning that we're thinking of, but how do we just simply appreciate? Yeah. So yeah, it's all of that and more. So in saying all of that, I think, and every episode I really try to invite and encourage the guests on the podcast to offer something that people can take and experience. But I think more than ever before in this episode, there is something to offer that can be experienced. You were talking about practices. I know that both of you chose a small practice that you'd like to share with us, but not through necessarily talking about it, but actually inviting us to experience it. So if you're listening to this in the car, maybe you won't be able to do this or to do whatever Haley and Natalie actually don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be a surprise for me too. And I'm going to enjoy it and playfully lean into it <laughs> despite my, my instinct of, oh no, what are you going to make me do? <laughs> listening to it in a, in a space where it can actually, you know, move. That'll be great. So Haley, you'll, you'll lead us into. A short practice first, and then that will take us different places, a different place. Yeah, I'm going to do, I don't know what Haley's going to do, but I, I know it's going to be more movement. So Haley's going to, I think, bring us up and I'm going to 
bring us down. I think beautiful. It's probably the flow, or I'm maybe so out perfect. and in, <laughs> out and in, <laughs> out and in. So before I begin, I do have music. So in a moment, I'll I'll kick that off. But I did want to acknowledge that a useful tool that I'd like to share today does directly come from uh, the 360 Emergence, and of course we'll put their link. Uh, in this afterwards, and it is about throwing down our anchors. So it's teaching ourselves to hold those contrasting emotions in disorientating dilemmas or the heat experiences, or even just feeling emotions, as we've said, can be, you know, you know, turning that into a safe practice in our body. And this is one that I use regularly when I'm about to do something vulnerable. It's not just on the dance floor. So if you're ever experiencing anything that takes you outside of your comfort zone or your nervous system starts to fire up, then I invite you to throw down your anchors. So we'll have a a practice of what that is like. So whether you are sitting or standing, to invite you to just feel your feet on the ground. Just taking a deep breath in and an even longer breath out. And if by either my voice or the breath or the music wants to move you, then let it. So perhaps you might just start to walk or sway. Just bringing your awareness into exploring the weight of your body on your feet. And maybe I merely want to roll my ankles, lubricating my hinges. But just noticing your feet on the ground and that the ground's coming up to support your whole body. And then as you're breathing, that the air around you is also supporting your whole body. And if you ever get caught up in your mind, you can just bring your awareness back to your feet grounded and supported by the ground. I'm just going to cultivate our awareness of the earth below. So let your mind's eye take you into that ground. Literally, there's several layers. There's soil, there's rock. We've got our continental crust. There's tectonic plates. There's a molten core generating our magnetic field. And then beneath that again, there's an inner solid core of iron. With all of the weight on your feet, I'm going to invite you now to imagine an anchor or anchors extending beneath you. Anchors are these wonderful things that you sink down into the mud or the earth or the rocks. But they give you a lot of room to move at the top. You're not just held in one particular spot. So that anchor allows you to travel around while you're still safely held in a spot. So just imagine what are you anchoring into? Now these could be micro moments in time. They could be a specific person, a specific place. Just feel their strength. They've got you. You've got you. And if you're not already, start to move with your anchors. So moving through your space or on your chair, Noticing the flexibility, the durability. And with this stability, you begin to stretch further up your body. So just start to soften into your bones, moving from your ankles and your knees. Into your hips. center, your belly we were talking about earlier, your digestion, your organs, the blood, your 30 trillion cells in your body, your rib cage, 
front of your body, the back of your body, the side of your body, your shoulders, your arms, your armpits, hands, fingers, even your chin. Just gently bringing your neck into the conversation with your body, into the undulation or the unfurling of your spine. And just dropping your head to your chest and gently rotating. And just bringing anything that wants to be moved into movement knowing that we're going to come to completion so you're at 30 seconds anything that wants to move that hasn't moved maybe you want to change tempo or pace conscious of the tone of my voice and this music maybe you want to shake it out bring it into something that's more vibrant or maybe it's calm into that slowness we were just talking about and bringing your awareness of breath back into your body, bringing your awareness back into your feet, as your feet are touching the ground, and taking a deep breath in. And an even longer breath out. And just noticing what's alive for you and your body. And once I feel anchored and connected to my embodied sense of strength, I know that I can perceive I perceive that I can test waters and opening and expanding whether it be relinquishing control or softening into a moment or holding discomfort I feel like uh exhaling <laughs> like a long <laughs> yeah always that thank was lovely so Haley. thank you thank, thank you so you. much for that gift Okay, well, we'll just take a few minutes now just to bring ourselves inward, shall we, so, so we can bring our conversation to a close. So we'll just do a few minutes practice of really sensation awareness and, and just noticing where we, we have space in the body. So if you have been standing up, coming to a seated position, in any seated position that feels comfortable to you, gently closing your eyes, placing your hands either on your knees or in your lap. And if you've just, you've just done Hades practice or if you've just come back from getting a cup of tea or some kind of movement, just noticing how that movement now feels in your body. Now that you're seated. Bringing your awareness to your breath. And noticing the quality of your breath. Maybe it's a little bit faster than usual. No need to change it, just noticing. And if you've just been moving, you may even feel your heartbeat. And just noticing your precious heartbeat. And perhaps even taking just a few deep breaths in through the nose and out through the nose. Breathing down into the chest, into the belly.
just noticing again the sensations that are present in your body from the movement you might notice some warmth some tingling some buzzing or you might not notice anything at all and that's perfectly okay And bringing your awareness to your head, your forehead. Noticing any tension in your brow. And seeing if you can let that soften just a touch. And bringing your awareness down to your face, your cheeks, your chin, your jaw. Noticing any tension as you scan down through your neck, the back of your neck, your shoulders. Continuing to breathe however you want to breathe as you scan. And bringing your awareness down through your chest, your back your belly, your hips, feeling your seat or your thighs on the chair beneath you, continuing to breathe in through the nose, out through the nose. And bringing your awareness down to your knees, your calves, your shins, your feet, your soles of your feet on the floor. And bringing your awareness to a particular place in your body that you feel some tension, some tightness. And perhaps just discomfort. Just allowing your awareness just to rest there, just for a moment. No need to change it. Just resting your awareness there. And then bringing your awareness to a place in your body that feels pleasant. feels spacious, even just the absence of tension. So it might be a spot on the back of your hand, your arm or your thigh. It's a place that feels absence of pain or tension. Resting your awareness there just for a few moments. Breathing into that space, into that sensation. Noticing any sensations you feel by keeping your awareness there in that place of spaciousness. And then taking a few breaths in through the nose, out through the nose, and bringing your awareness back to your whole body. So zooming out again and just taking in your whole body, from your head, out through your toes. And taking a last few breaths into the whole of the body. You might even breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. And then before opening your eyes, just wiggling your toes, your fingers, bringing a little bit of movement back into the body, stretching if you need to, and then flickering your eyes open when you're ready.
I had no idea how much my tired jet lagged body needed both of these practices today. <laughs> thank mm-hmm. you, Natalie. You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, you Natalie. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And maybe, it maybe is. an invitation. I'm just noticing it in myself, and maybe our listeners might notice it in themselves. This is what slowing down actually feels like. I don't feel sluggish. I feel just more peaceful and calm and. Maybe more prone to listening now than I was 15 minutes ago. Beautiful. And what we might... should have done this at the start, right? <laughs> yeah. Just, we could have. We could have. We can always listen to this episode in reverse. The <laughs> shut Start with the end. It, it does feel like almost the natural close. And I do want to say that we are cooking something for next year when Mm -hmm. Haley might invite us into a deeper experience and create a a webinar. We're we're not going to call it probably a webinar because it's going to be a very different experience from a webinar. It's going to be an experience. Yeah. So we can play with more of these modalities. Perhaps maybe just one last question for both of you as we close this conversation. What's your highest hope for this work you are doing and you're both so passionate about? It's a question I really love and I love how diverse our answers are to this question. And perhaps it's also a reminder for the people listening to us. We, we do what we do, hopefully for a reason. There's a hope we hold. We sometimes maybe lose touch with it, but it's worth reminding ourselves once in a while what that highest hope is. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot with this. uh, No, (laughs) but yeah. I think I I thought it actually comes quite easily for me. This is Natalie. I think it's really about bringing, it's in service of presence to life. Presence to life, presence to ourselves, presence to others. That That's really it for me, you know, and this word that keeps bubbling around as we've been speaking today is just aliveness, feeling alive with life. And to me, that's presence. So that's my highest hope with both embodiment and development work is about being in presence with life. Yeah. So beautiful. I agree with that. And I'm glad that my physiological response, Alice, when you asked that question, is I nearly burst into tears because of that desire, yes, for the world and the aliveness and the presence, Natalie. But I immediately went to home and thought of the humans that I care for deeply and that it's not just a work, it's a lived thing for me as well. It's it's something that I I can't I cannot live without. And I don't know how I lived without it before my latest iteration in the last few years. But obviously, as we said, if we think at the beginning, I've been living with it all my life, just it's evolved in different forms and different capacities or different languages of how to move. But it's now about resourcing. It's the ability to feel resourced enough, yes, to live. So if we balance the two together, that capacity to yeah, face life with an inner resource to access that untapped resource for so everyone. I, I wish for this for every human who I care deeply about and all of those who are not met yet. Beautiful. And I've learned so much and I, I've reflected on embodiment in, in so many new ways today. So I'm so deeply grateful to both of you for your wisdom, but also for the way you embody what we are talking about, even in the way you held this conversation and you held us and offered a bit of your practice. I, I just felt we are walking the talk and this is perhaps ultimately what embodiment is being, what we are talking about. There will be lots of resources in the show notes and obviously mm-hmm. both Haley and Natalie's website so you can read more and learn more about what they do and how they do it. And I'm very curious what this sparks for people. The comments that arise once we these episodes go out and the questions that pop up and the 
reflections that come up are uh, always fascinating. So bring them on. Deep, deep gratitude, Haley and Natalie, for being you and bringing this work into the world. I'm so grateful to know both of you. Thank you. Deep gratitude Likewise. for you, Alice. Yeah, beautiful, Natalie. Look forward to much, many more playful moments ahead. I hope you listened to this episode someplace where you could move or close your eyes and get in touch with your body. And as we're heading into the holidays and hopefully some rest and family time and me time for each of us at year's end, I do hope you have more opportunities to truly, deeply and consciously connect with your bodies. I was reflecting, re-listening to the episode that for the holidays, we always eat a lot. And I'm wondering whether there might be an opportunity to actually mindfully eat at this time of year when everybody is just, you know, overeating. So what might that look like to enjoy food in a very mindful way? If you've enjoyed Haley and Natalie's thinking, there will be an opportunity to learn from them in a much deeper way. In a workshop they will be putting together, the Vertical Development Institute will be hosting it. Hope that we'll see more of you there to get deeper into the topic of the role our bodies play in our development, the implications for organizations, the capacities that leaders who are in touch with their bodies are actually able to activate and use in day-to-day -day life and much, much more. So watch this space. This is the first step towards something that I'm hoping will grow next year, whereby the Vertical Development Institute will be hosting and inviting thinkers, facilitators in the developmental space to share their wisdom with a broader community. I would love us to become a knot in the big web, space holders or space creators for learning to happen. And the only way to do that is if it goes way beyond me and my own work and expanding the circle of wise souls that we can all learn from. So Natalie and Haley's workshop will be the first of hopefully others to come in the new year. So with that in mind, thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being part of this growing community. I'm humbled by your messages, by your thoughts, by your questions. Please keep them coming in the comment section. And wishing you all a peaceful, joyful end of your year. Very excited about what 2024 has in store for all of us. Until next time, stay awake, stay conscious and stay wise.